that um, watching the film, taking notes, there are parts that I would fast forward through because it was just too painful <laughs> to watch. Um, the, the morning after scene with Bina, where Bina's just like, you know, it was, you know, I'm not gay gay and don't tell anybody. Um, it's just, it's devastating, you know. Um, so there's so much going on in that film um, that we want to get to, but I also don't want us to monopolize the conversation. I'm really curious what your feedback is and, and your comments on on the film and the ideas in the film, and um, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Is this on? Oh, there it is. Hi. Um, I didn't f I fast forward through any of the film, but I know that whenever I watch a LGBTQ film, my guts are always in a knot, just enough, because I'm always terrified of what could happen to the characters in the film. I can never totally relax. Um, and I'm glad that we're in the time of happy endings. The 90s weren't really like that for queer films. They were always horribly tragic. Um, you know, and even though this, I mean, this film was so beautiful that gut clench was no different. Um, just because we know something's gonna happen. Um, yes, to it, get to the good part, maybe, but something's going to happen. It really is akin to watching a horror film in so many ways because you're on the edge of your seat and you're waiting for either, you know, um, some sort of violent explosion where the ki where so, you know a character will be gay bashed. You're waiting for an explosion where someone will be kicked out of their home. You're waiting for, you know, that god awful moment when this first love turns out to be a betrayal of some sort. So it's a real emotional roller coaster watching these films. And I don't know, it might be generational because as Tisa said, watching LGBTQ films in the 90s was truly, it was very different than watching films now, um, LGBTQ films now. And, um, but for those of us who are of a certain age, you know, <laughs> that conditioning that you get in watching those films is, you know, never really leaves you. Yeah. And one of the things that I think is so wonderful about what Dee Reese did in this film is she she took all those sort of tropes, all those um, you know possible devastating events, and she really she split them between Laura and um, Alike, and she did it in such a way that it never felt like she was going down the checklist of you know these are this is what happens. She really she really humanized ideas, and she did it with such economy. And one example of that, that economy that I'm speaking of, and it's not necessarily about Alike and Laura, but it, it illustrates what I'm talking about, is the way in which the, the guy in the liquor store, who is such a homophobic, lesbophobic asshole, you know, he, he really is sort of like a, dist a distillation of societal homophobia. But he's really, the way he's sketched in so quickly, so succinctly, you know, it doesn't feel like she's simply trying to get an idea across. He's, that's a real character. And that's one of the really amazing things about the film, the ways in which um, these grace strokes, these powerful, powerful strokes and building character and, and, and moving the narrative forward is done. Um, it's really a testimony to her, her fantastic writing. Yeah, and when that same homophobic asshole guy is outside talking to his friend um, after the driving lesson, I mean, it just takes it one step further. Now there's two people talking about her, talking about all these other people, and there's just this potential for all kinds of things. Like my mind raced, you know, the very first time I saw the film, I didn't know wh like where that could possibly come back against Alike or anybody else, but the threat of them was so palpable. And I really love that also about Dee Reese's filmmaking and her, her uh, the screenplay, the writing, is that the entire world um, around Alike and Laura, um, around the parents, Audrey and Arthur, is fleshed out. You know, we're not guessing about who they are, where they live, what they care about, who their friends are, um, especially seeing Alike's mother at work, which is a rarity to see, like her character is actually fleshed out outside of the home as much as inside, and so is Arthur's and Alike's. Like everybody has an inside and an outside. Um, and we get to see 
interior and exterior impacts on their lives and, and how that shapes who they are and how they respond to the world. And that may seem so obvious that that should be the way it is, but that's not the way it is in filmmaking, especially filmmaking that involves black people um, and queer people. There's a, there's a way in queer black people, there's, there's a way to, of flattening. Um, and this film was only what, 84 minutes. Mm -hmm. She did a lot in 84 minutes. Um, I felt like, and I lived in Brooklyn, and I'm, anyway, I'm not gonna get into the, the, the verite details of like how spot on um, the club scenes really were. Um, and, you know, but um, it was beautiful to feel like I went somewhere that I knew and that was familiar. Um, and it'd be interesting to hear how that felt to you, whether you've been to Brooklyn or not. I think also for me, what was wonderful about that familiarity is how black the film was, how black the world that was captured was, because quite yeah, often, I mean. both in terms of literature and in terms of filmmaking, um, black LGBTQ, LGBTQ, they did I I something out? IA. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> for now. Um, characters. <laughs> the way that we, the way that we, are actualized is we have to leave blackness, we have to leave community, and usually get a white partner, right? Mm -hmm. And to have this narrative unfold, this really layered, dense narrative unfold within the, within the I don't wanna say confines, because what, what it really showed was the expansiveness of blackness. Yeah. Um, and you saw, you, you, yes, you saw homophobia, you saw familial dysfunction, you saw a lot of heartbreak, but you also saw a lot of beauty, and you saw com community taking care of one another. I mean, at the end, after you know, Alike and Laura have had their you know their tense moments and and sort of a rupture in their friendship, you know, Alike had a place to go, and we can we can gauge how huge that is just when we flash back to the scene of the young women um, at the pier, and how many you know if you listen to their conversation and it's very quick sentences, it's not a whole bunch of you know spelled out things, but you understand that these are these are kids who have been kicked out of their homes, they're sleeping on the streets, they're sleeping at the, on the pier. And when Laura takes you know, one person, one, one young woman home and, and you know, to sleep on the sofa for the night, you know, that's really huge and it's, to me it's really moving. And again, it's not sentimental, it's not you know, something that obviously tugs at your heartstrings, but given the context of what you've seen before, which is, as I said before, very economically sketched in, but very powerfully sketched in, you know what that means and you understand the significance of community. Right, and one other thing that I, this film is in conversation with a lot of other films and a lot of other things in interesting ways. Those of you who've seen the film Paris is Burning, you know, you'll remember that the um, young queer folk in that film, the only place they really had to hang out outside from their houses was the pier, you know, and so this film sort of capturing again, you know, what the pier was. And if you, when you look in the background, you can see a young woman doing sex work, um, you know, going to the car, and so, you know, the, the complicated nature of the peer and what people do to survive and what sex work is in that context, I mean, it's all just really wonderfully quickly sketched in, but you, you, get, the, um, you get the impact of it. And on that point, too, about the blackness of the film um, and the whole, even the alternative scene is black. You know, I mean, I would love to go to a house party and Tamar Carly was in the living room, you know, um, that never happened to me. Um, but it's just like, instead of defaulting to um, that, you know, it's a very, to me at this point, rather hackneyed and unimaginative narrative where a black queer person or a person of, a queer person of color um, to live a queer life has to be isolated within uh, a white environment. And instead, Bina is her conduit, even though Bina is a bit duplicitous. Um, just you know, a bit. Just a bit. I mean, it's just, you know, I'm not, whatever, I'm not gay, gay, gay. Um, but she's also um, the way that Alike gets to the life that she's after. You know, she's not that comfortable in the club with the exotic dancer and with the all the AGs that she's hanging out with, even so she even though she's like changing into these costumes, not costumes, I don't mean it that way, but she does change, you know, into this other persona that she hasn't quite 
grown into. She hasn't quite claimed. And when she meets Bina, her clothing changes. You know, um, her colors change. Everything kind of changes. Um, and even in suggesting that uncomfortable moment to Laura, you know, like maybe we could do something different. Maybe we could go to a spoken word. And, you know, she's... It's such a beautiful, I mean, she writes this poem about the butterflies and chrysalis, and it's kind of, it's just really beautiful to kind of see her self-actualization, and that she needed Bina, even though Bina breaks her heart, she kind of, you know, gets a sexual experience and kind of breaks out that way, but also kind of, you know, identifies her tribe. Um, and it's, you know, there's another film that, to me, this film is in conversation with, which we showed a number of clips from last week, which is Medicine for Melancholy. The character Micah, you know, complains a lot about being in San Francisco and that, like, uh, the whole alternative scene is is white and, you know, if you're going to be alternative, all your friends are white, all the people you date are white, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, Dee Reese shows, a, you know, uh, and, you know, that's San Francisco for you also, so what can you do? Um, you know, but D. Reese shows a very, you know, different possibility. Um, and Brooklyn is different that way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I love this film for that. And I think also, too, on that tip, um, and may, I don't mean to, I don't want to overthink it or over talk it because we want to be in conversation with you, but um, it's curious, I'll say, um, and maybe intentional that uh, Alike and Bina um, are both, you know, they connect, but they're both kids who have one, at least one parent and are living at home that also kind of share this interest that, that you know, their connections, um, uh, you know, that might just be an incidental thing that happens about their households um, and their shared interests. Um, and, and it kind of comes to a head when Bina is with Alike at the pier. You know, there's a whole other group of, all of Laura's friends, they're one way, and you know we see a, a very different crews of people. You know, and Tamar Kali's music is still playing, not the hip hop that was playing before when Alike stood um, Laura up. Um, and so the kind of fissure between social groups within black community gets shown, just as much as it gets shown between the homophobic asshole guy and. Alike's father, who's, you know, we see a black cop. And what that also, the tensions of that in community. So there's a lot of stuff that Dee Reese kind of brings to bear just by really paying attention to full spectrum blackness in relation, uh, people in relation to each other, um, instead of defaulting to any kind of ready-mades about what we think we know um, about black people or black communities or queerness. I wanted to build on one thing that Tisa mentioned when she talked about the ways in which Alike's clothing changed and, and when she met Bina. You know, this, the film also really opens up the conversation about drag because quite often when we talk about drag, we talk about gay men, femme, whatever, but we don't really talk too much about drag and unless you are, you know, um, you know, consciously immersed in lesbian culture and lesbian literature, the larger conversations about drag tend to default to gay men, and um, specifically femme gay men, and to see this film really illustrating the ways in which drag plays out um, in lesbian culture, and especially for a young lesbian who is really trying to figure out, figure out her identity, you know, it's the, the, the reason that she is so anxious for Laura to get off the bus <laughs> at the beginning of the film, it's not just, oh, you know, you're going to miss your stop, it's, I can't let you see me get back into this kind of drag that I have to perform for my mother because I have, a, I have an image for you and I, you, I have a persona for you. And I don't know if, if any, how many of you saw the short film, but that, that point was really, um, really expanded in the film. It became a real point of conflict between the two, the ways in which Laura dressed um, at school and the way in which she dressed when she and Laura went out versus the way in which she dressed at home. And Laura in the short film was really kind of almost brutal for trying to force Alike to make a choice and be one way. And it was really clear that Alike is still navigating a lot. And what's also interesting about that is, you know, both Alike and Laura are, for lack of a better term, baby butches, right? But under that category handing, there's so much nuance, there's so much possible um, variety. 
And Laura is, you know, is one iteration of that, and, and the Lique is another. And you don't really see, um, you don't see that kind of gradation, um, you know, very often. The acknowledgement of there are multiple ways of being not just a lesbian, but multiple ways of being a butch. And the film, you know, with these young women illustrated that in a really, you know, wonderful way, I thought. Does everybody, is everybody aware, I mean, we didn't, I didn't um, specify this in the introduction to the film, um, that this was at first a, a short film that was expanded into a feature. The short film isn't easy to find anymore. Um, it's kind of got pulled once the feature film came out, but it, it was a, it was like less than 30 minutes. Wasn't it like 26 minutes? It's not even 20 minutes, I don't think, yeah. 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 Um, it's about 9.30, should we just kind of open it up? Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? I mean, we have more that we can, but... Oh, yeah. We've got, like, <laughs> a full-on lecture of notes. I, mean, I have to say, one of my favorite lines in any film ever is, what is it? You're a grown-ass woman, brah. <laughs> because there is just so much embedded in that line. I mean, you have queer theory and feminist theory <laughs> and performance theory all in one, in that one line. It's just really brilliant. I, I, okay, if I was gonna, the thing that got my attention is tie your head up. When the, the mother, um, Audrey is telling Alike to tie your head up, and then the Tamar Kali song, the first one that plays that I'm forgetting the name of, um, oh, in, in when she, uh, Alike is in Bina's room, and the lyrics are like, um, her lips are full, like her legs are brown, her lips are full, and like her head's not tied up, or something like that. There's a line like that in the song, and there's like this intention around freeing your mind, you know, like the mother's just like, <laughs> hold it down, all of it. Um, and then there's this kind of like, get out of it. So I, as soon as I heard tie your head up, there was like, between black mothers and daughters, it was just so fraught with a whole lot of stuff. As soon as I heard it, I was like, oh yeah. The soundtrack, um, is period, dope. is really quite exceptional. <laughs> There's amazing. a way in which, I mean, the majority of the music is by women artists, or at least the lead vocals are by women. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which those songs and, and what those songs are saying sort of emerge as a kind of Greek chorus, um, giving us both the internal and external world of Alike. So it's very, very interesting. And I loved having Tamar Kali in the film because that also puts the film back in conversation with um, Afropunk. The original documentary. Early Afropunk. Early Afro, not not that, now. Not this Coachella bullshit <laughs> that is there now. Black but, Chella. But like early, Afro Chella. <laughs> early Afropunk, which was really about, um, you know, about black identity and expanding it and, and trying to find other ways of being black, you know, find, embracing other sounds and aesthetics and still being black, not feeling like you had to abandon blackness in order to explore things that were not quote unquote stereotypically black. And all of that that nuance and that layeredness and that really beautiful conversation is just gone around Afropunk now, but this film sort of returns um, us to that conversation as well. And Bradford Young. Yeah, okay. Bradford Young, who now you know, is working with Ava DuVernay. And, he was the DP um, on Moonlight. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Any questions? Should I just like, share my mic? Comments, questions? Do we have anyone? I can just go down and walk around with it. Oh, there's someone. Oh, okay. There's, there's people. Okay. I was like, I'll get out of here. <laughs> go do something else. Um, thank you for talking. I also know I don't have any questions. I just want to comment as well because it was so exciting to see. Um, I really like how they ex it kind of exploded these ideas of sexual identity through all of these characters, like thinking about the woman in the, s the school who was interested in the main character and was like, I like girls, but I love boys, or um, how they try to, I don't know if redeem is a fair word, but think about the complexity of the space that Bina is in and thinking about like growing up in the church and having this queer experience and then kind of freaking out, but then having this moment with the boy where she's like, ah, oh, don't kiss me. Mm -hmm. um, and things along these terms of um, class, I think about the way that 
um, Bina and Alike are able to connect, but navigate the world in a different space than um, Laura. Laura. Yeah. Um, and so are there these issues to, to access to particular spaces and experiences and um, just seeing all of that in this kind of like black metropolis that isn't problematized, like no one's actually thinking about the absence of whiteness, for instance. Um, and like, it was, it was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, going um, back to um, something you said very early when you started speaking, um, that scene in the high school where, you know, the, the, the young woman says, um, if she was just a little bit harder. Yeah. yeah. Right? I really love that because <laughs> it, it, it shows the ways in which, you know, the kind of information that you're getting about identity and, and desirability and authenticity, it, it just sort of floats through the air, right? I mean, it's, it's all mm -hmm. around us. Mm -hmm. And that statement, the way it's delivered and the way that Alike is positioned in that scene, the way she hears it, you know, it's, it's really symbolic of the ways in which all of us are getting messages all the time from, mm -hmm. from all, all sorts of places about, you know, what we need to do and what we need to be in order to be seen, in order to be, to be yeah. desirable, in order to be authentic. And so this is like this sort of throwaway line, which is, you know, delivered almost for laughs, but it, the way it comes, you know, comes to her mm -hmm. and tells her, you know, what she might need to experiment with, because that's, you know, shortly after that, she's walking around with a strap on, right? <laughs> that um, was so yeah. wrong so, on every level. <laughs> that was so wrong. So, um, <laughs> that's what I mean about the ways in which Dewey is just like through a, a great deal of filmmaking economy, yeah. you know, was doing a lot of, yeah. of but, work. And if I could just say too, I, I mean, I really loved Alike's response in, you know, kind of overhearing all of this. She's just like, Huh? Like, is it going to be harder? What are you talking about? But I also noticed this time, and not when I watched the film before, that the very first scene of Alike entering high school and she makes a beeline for the bathroom to change her clothes, the first only person that we kind of see blurry coming down the hallway is Bina. Mm -hmm. They walk right by each other. And I was just like, okay. So even in, and that's like in that moment of a, a transformation is about to occur for Alike, and she's walking by this this bi girl, or not bi bi girl, or not gay gay girl, or whatever, um, who is going to be part of that transformation very shortly. Um, and that was just again just real economizing um, with who shows up where and what shows up when. Um, that's part of the storytelling, and I love it for that. I also think the way in which. Bina and the mother are handled in the film. It's very similar. Um, you know, the mother is... Bina and Audrey or Bina and Bina's mother? Bina and Audrey. You know, um, Audrey is clearly a very, very damaged woman in a lot of ways. And she's, she's lonely. She's miserable in this marriage. She's, she's shown, shown literally clutching her Bible, right? Um, the way in which she performs, you know, um, for her husband and the brutality almost with which she regards her. Um, on one hand, she's, she's a monstrous figure, right? But we're also, we're forced to see her woundedness and it really complicates our, our um, response to her. You know, I mean, when she at the end says, I'll, you know, I'll be praying for you instead of saying I love you back to her daughter, that's horrific, that's just, that's nightmarish. But at the same time, given the performance of the of Kim Wayans in that role, you see this is a woman who is so damaged on her own, right? And likewise with Bina, those of us who are those of us who are queer, um, there's some Bina in our background. If you're old enough, there's someone who is like, oh, I'm not really gay, <laughs> right? Um, and <laughs> and. But we have, to, we have to be kind of generous with Bina as well. I mean, she's on her journey. She's exploring, and she has the right to do that. Mm -hmm. She does not have the right, of course, to be so cavalier with another person's feelings, which is hopefully something she'll learn quickly before she does too much damage to too many other people. Um, but you know, she's also on her own journey as a, as a young woman exploring her sexuality and her identity. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which the film does not simply let us hate Bina or hate Audrey, um, I think speaks to the wisdom um, and, and deep empathy of Dee Reese for all of her characters. Um, 
which I think is just a, a really wonderful quality for her to have as a filmmaker. There's a question way in the back. And then there's well, another one way over there in the back. You guys are so quiet. <laughs> Hi. Ooh, okay. Um, it's less of a question, but also more of a comment also on the portrayal of the black family in this movie. Um, I've seen the short film and the full feature, and I think it's very interesting, the portrayal of her dad and their relationship and how they converse with each other versus the short film, he's shown as more of the brutal character. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very interesting in the feature film, I don't know if she decided, D. Reese, or whoever decided to change his image, I guess, and make him the comforting parent and make him really like the emotional support for her. I thought that was very interesting. Um, just a portrayal of like a black father on screen. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. And th those of you who haven't seen the short, it's the father who mm -hmm. um, beats Alike. And it's actually a much more brutal beating than we saw in this film. It's really hard to watch. Mm -hmm. And I th I, one of the things I've, because I've thought about that same question, why the father is, is changed so radically from the short film to the... Um, feature and I think you know is to show that even as as she's daddy's girl and he's the loving father he's also erasing her constantly and it's, it sort of puts a kind of condition on his love the only way I can really love you is to not really fully see you and that's a source of extreme frustration for her because you know at, one, you know, at that at that point she says you knew you know you know mm -hmm. and in order for him to maintain his image of her, he has to constantly push the reset button and sort of delete all the new information he gets because he can't or won't let himself fully see his daughter. And so that is in itself, I don't want to say it's violence because I think we're at a point in our culture where everything is fucking violence and that means nothing's violence. But I do think that um, it's, a psychological, it's a kind of psychological harm that he's doing to her because it makes her... She doesn't really have his love. She doesn't really have a strong foundation that she can lean on if he doesn't see her. And so I think it grants a kind of psychological complexity to, to have one parent who is outwardly hostile, who is you know, capable of literally putting her hands on her daughter, and the other parent who seemingly is loving and understanding, but in his own way is um, inflicting another kind of damage. And so there's, a, there's an interesting dynamic that arises because of that. Yeah, his denial is deep. His denial is really deep. And yeah, and in that moment, like he has to apologize for letting Audrey beat Alike. Um, but I, I always read that scene as, you know, that's, it's him too. He was giving her a beating too by standing there, and he apologizes later. Um, but he, he let Audrey do it. Um, it's like she, she acted out something that it's not like he wouldn't have, but he, he didn't in that moment. And I don't want to go outside the frame of the film, and it is an interesting choice of D. Reese to kind of in, invert um, those characters that way. Um, and I'm glad that you brought that up, too, because the specter of that from the short film stayed with me, and I kept expecting that and worse, or both of them, when I saw the, the feature length. Um, but I think the father is an interesting character, too, um, in that there's just enough space, even though his denial, and I agree with you, um, you know, is a kind of like gaslighting. Um, and maybe I don't want to use that term either because that's also starting to get into murky territory. Um, but that he, he recognizes Alike. He, there's something that he sees in her that he recognizes um, and that he enjoys. Um, he has two daughters, but he kind of can have one son, kind of. And I don't mean to like go that far, but he runs ball with her. You know, he says, yeah, you look good. Untuck the, if you got to wear the pink sweater, wear it untucked, it's better. You know, there are these moments of recognition um, that aren't um, just about, 
you know, expedience and calming things down in the household, that there's something that he sees. Um, and it's hard, um, but I, I, I kind of uh, appreciated that to the extent that the character was allowed to kind of show. And I also want to point out the casting is really important to this film, and I really admired um, the casting director who made all of the relatives, all of the family, look like family and understood blackness in that way and wasn't just kind of random and haphazard in casting people. Bina and her mother looked like they had something to do with each other. You, you know, the spread of family um, for Alike and her sister, uh, Sharonda, um, Audrey and... Arthur, yeah, you know that you can you can see it. There's not, you know, someone you, someone other casting directors show all kinds of other weird skin biases and things like that, or bizarre configurations of family that don't seem to, at least to me, make a lot of sense. Um, and the casting in this, and Laura and and her mother and her sister as well. And that scene was devastating. You know, with Laura's mother is just, just didn't recognize, didn't acknowledge her at all. Um, but watching them and seeing that the casting was, there was some attention paid, um, I, I really appreciated. No, and speaking of family, the, the, the film also really was a tribute to sisterhood because both Laura and Alike mm -hmm. had sisters who had their backs in mm -hmm. their own way. I mean, initially, Sharonda just seems like she's going to be a bratty kid. And she is. And she is. <laughs> But she also turned out to be actually very cool and and uh, and a source of support. And the the stink guy she's giving her parents after, at the at the dinner table, you know, after these green Alique's beans are song, so delicious. That's the same you know, thing she's um, doing. That's also a show of support. Yeah. But um, but the support that Laura had from her sister as well, and and I really loved um, the way in which that relationship was shown, and it was very moving. That you know, not only was Laura. Um, living with her sister, but she was like, you know, she had this job and she's trying to support. And you can see their struggle, their economic struggle. Um, and the sister, despite the struggle, is saying, you should not be working, you should go, you know, you should be studying, you should go back to school. That would so clearly be a huge hardship for her if Laura were to not be bringing um, income in. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the bond between sisters and, and the, the ways in which support was shown from both ends was really quite lovely, I thought. Hi, thanks to you both for your um, comments. I had a question about how you see the role of art in this film as a kind of space of refuge. Um, it's there in subtle ways around the spoken word event, around the poetry that the character uses to express herself, and then also the music um, that, as you said, is a kind of other parallel um, presence in the film yeah. and also makes comments on what's happening in the narrative. So if you could talk about that whole trope of art as refuge from this kind of daily violence. And you know, I'd also like to give props to Maine, um, the dancer um, who opened, that's, that's art too. It's very artfully done. You know, it takes a lot of skill to do what Maine was doing and I appreciate her for that. And that was a refuge for some of us to watch her move. And I'm not being flippant. I'm actually being quite serious. She has quite an amazing career doing what she's doing. And, you know, this is another sort of off-kilter off, off response, but I loved the way the film took Kaya's My Neck, My Back and just, like, sort of claimed it as a, a lesbian anthem. You know, I mean, if you've ever seen the, the video for that song, it's Kaya surrounded by all these different men, and she's sort of barking orders, you know, eat this, eat that, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, and to have that reclaimed um, and repositioned as like a lesbian, I mean, it just it takes on a completely different meaning and a completely different resonance um, in the way in which it's used in that film. But, you know, for me, I knew that I would be, be interested in the way the film handled the question of art, just the way the teacher, in the, in, in, you know, when she first, when we first meet the teacher, and she doesn't coddle Alike about her poetry. She's like, yeah, it's all right. You know, and we clearly know that this is a very special relationship between them. I mean, the, the queer kid who has that one teacher who at lunchtime you can go 
and you don't have to deal with anybody's bullshit. They will let you sit and, and eat your lunch in their classroom. That's a very important and almost sacred relationship for a lot of queer kids. Um, but we know that it's a relationship in which Alike is taken seriously precisely because she's not coddled you know, in that moment. Um, mm, and in that moment too, not in that moment, but at the same time, in a different safe space, Bina's bedroom, you know, Bina gets to kind of school Alike about this other, or they have an exchange, but it's really Bina that takes the lead on, you know, a whole realm of alternative music. And, you know, it's a, it's the other part of art's presence um, is independent musicians, um, underground musicians, and the exchange between these peers, these two young girls, um, who are teaching each other about a world in which they can belong um, and and find space um, to be themselves in and enjoy. Um, and so I really love that scene too. It's just so like beautifully and typically teenager, the one upping like, what you know about? I didn't even know who they were talking about. I was like, who? Um, but that they could be each other's teachers in one way, but certainly actually peer to peer that Bina you know, being a little bit more sophisticated um, and already being within a world that it seemed Alike um, wanted to kind of be a part of. Um, and gently, you know, that they, they were very caring with each other in that exchange. Um, and it's so funny that they never, they were in the same class the whole time, hearing each other's writing um, and never connected until Alike's mother forced it, which is another little twist to the film that I just really loved. I was just like, oh, okay, mom did Alike a solid and doesn't even know it. Um, so that was, that was really good. And I think, you know, just talking about art, you know, we live in a, a really horrible moment in which everything is content. And mm -hmm. the emotional response that people have to art, the ways in which it really saves lives, the ways in which people you know, dive into poetry, the way in which people dive into songs because they're really trying to find themselves, they're, they're seeking refuge, mm -hmm. they're seeking information about themselves or the world, it really gets lost in this, these conversations about branding and content and all this bullshit. And to see a film in which what, it really, what, it, what art means, that it can, really, it can literally save your life, right? And it can literally be the glue that... that um, Brings that holds relationships together. Um, it's just really refreshing to see um, art discussed, and that's in the film does that to see art discussed in that way, um, and especially given the way in which music and film and literature and everything is talked about now, which can be so disheartening and can can be so detached from the true power and possibilities of art. And we see that Laura is outside of that you know, in relationship to Alike. You know, Laura is not in school. Laura doesn't see what Alike looks like in school. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't know about Alike's notebook. She doesn't, and when there's an invitation to do some of it, she's not comfortable. Um, she doesn't want, she's like, you know, and it's all about getting women, right? Like, so that's not, <laughs> I'm not doing that. You know, there's plenty of women at the club and there's not that, moment um, of generosity from Laura to say, oh, okay, let's, let's do something that you like. Um, and so this, it also kind of encapsulates, you know, a little bit of, you know, the, the, the disconnect there can be um, between people and, and art, um, poetry, um, anything. Um, you know, and again, that Laura is outside of that moment in the classroom when the teacher, after Alike reads, um, the teacher asks, you know, so, okay, what did you all think? And it kind of fades out when you start hearing one of the students talking about what they thought. Um, you know, Laura's not a part of that um, environment. And since that's also AP, you know, talking about like intellect and this ranking and class and stuff like that, um, the whole spectrum uh, around education and where Laura and Alike would fall in the high school, they might not necessarily be together that way anyway. Um, so the, the film really does, a, again, a lot of work in a very economical way. I think there's a question in the back. 
Um, just piggybacking off your comment about um, art and like the the ways that content is um, put out there now, and that so I feel like sometimes um, the ways that people use art and in lesser form or not as well known forms kind of gets lost. You said the way it saves lives. It kind of made me think about. Um, like resistance and liberation, and how usually we only see it on a grand scale of marching and policy. But um, I think this film really showcased these smaller cases of resistance and liberation against, you know, gender norms or just the way that Alike wanted to um, express her butchness, so to speak, or her queerness, those little acts of um, resistance against what Laura wanted her to be, or her parents wanted her to be, or what Bina wanted her to be. I think sometimes we overlook those smaller forms of resistance um, instead of, and just look at the bigger ones, but I just really like the way the film yeah. did that. That's a good point, very good point. There's another question further back. I'm still trying to digest it. <laughs> Um, and because of art, I mean, like she said at the end, art was her choice. She left. She escaped like her crazy, fanatic Christian family because of art. She went to Berkeley. That was her choice. And that was that was her, you know, her saving grace. And Dee Reese did such a great job adding the poetry, you know, to her character. Yeah. But, you know, but you know, it wasn't, I mean, the family wasn't a, a, a fanatical Christian family. That was the mom. And I think that was mom, like one correct. of the interesting dynamics. You know, the, the tension between the mother and, and the dad. Religion was one of the, I mean, you know, he was at home eating spaghetti and drinking beer while the family went out to church. Well, he so, wasn't. Yeah, correct. correct. Right. So, so it, you know, it has a, it has a, that's an interesting sort of charged current through which Alike is swimming at home. Um, you know, she's getting mixed messages from in so many different ways. And so, um, yeah, and some Christians are yeah. very against yeah. being gay. So, I mean, to me, I mean, like you say, it's a queer movie. I'm a heterosexual male, and I'm, as a human being, if how, I mean, just if you have any kind of compassion, you're just blown away from this movie. It's, 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 everyone should see it. It's so powerful. And uh, it's interesting when she's making out with Bina, she's, I don't know if anyone, uh, she was rubbing her her uh, tattoo, mm -hmm. her ohm, which the beginning and the ending and the end of the relationship. That was interesting, kind of. Mm -hmm. So thank Good you. Catch. These on sin is everything. There's another question in the back, or comment. Um, actually, I have a question and a comment. So I'm going to make the comment first, um, because I feel like Bina and um, like her kind of like navigating her own sexuality as well in the movie, which is really true because um, I grew up in a Catholic school as all girls and I grow up with a lot of lesbian couples and after graduating, they basically, a lot of like the more feminine side of the lesbian couples so will always kind of like, well, I grow out of it or like, well, I'm not like gay, gay, like, you know, that kind of scenario is like not a lot of LGBTQ like films actually we show in the movies, which I found it really raw and honest about like not only, you know, everybody else in the LGBTQ community is finding also like even for, you know, straight girls or whatever, like is just have like a journey to kind of find out who they are as well in throughout the process, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So my question is, I realize when Laura is um, opening up her locker, looking to the pictures, so I kind of guess uh, maybe she liked her. That's why she didn't say anything about, well, I don't think it's that good. Or like, you know, she's trying to say, the, you know, the doubts. So I kind of guess like, Maybe she liked her. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we had a, a long conversation about that last night. And that led us to talking about the sort of erotic charge that can be in a lot of friendships, period. Um, even heterosexual you know, friendships, the, the erotic charge. And, um, and for, I think for young queer people who are really figuring out their sexuality, 
you know, when you have um, hormones and, and emotions and all these things in play at once, and you're really trying to figure out who you are and where to put all this stuff, and, you know, the person who is your best friend um, becomes, you know, the, your, the object of your desire or whatever, and it, be it becomes really complicated. But I also think, um, I, 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 like, I like the larger um, question and idea of the ways in which erotic energy um, circulates between friends, period. And the ways in which sometimes the choices that are made and the, the actions that are taken um, are rooted in that energy. And it's not necessarily something that's going to be consummated. You know, it's not necessarily something that is going to um, spark into um, a romantic relationship, but it is a kind of energy that helps fuel the relationship. Yeah, we were talking about, I, I really noted that, that moment too. Um, and I liked how the camera hung just long enough on Laura and her gaze kind of going down uh, the, 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 the locker and kind of resting for a moment on this photograph of Alike. And I was just like, hmm, what is that? Um, and, you know, so we had this whole conversation at first. I was like, okay, Laura later says that, you know, tells Alike that she loves her. Um, is that love or love love you know is that was it a little more ambiguous and more friendship or was it uh, an expression of something more and Alike's response was kind of like hold on wait a minute we need to talk more about this and you know and Laura's like deuces and kind of leaves um, and so we were talking about and I think this is important too because the film does begin um, with a quote from uh, Audre Lorde and so to think about like the uses of the erotic and the erotic as power you know we were talking about you know what is the charge that goes into our work as activists how do we select our friends um, you know Audre Lorde was talking about um, the use of the erotic as part of, of teaching as well as organizing and it's kind of part you know this kind of idea around a, 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 not just an idea, a feeling um, of attraction, it's energy and like what does kind of you know, influence our choices to kind of be together and work together um, in a way that's, that's a, you know, the erotic is about the, the sensual and all of these other um, kind of impulses that aren't about the sex act. Right? Um, it could might be in the back of someone's mind from time to time, but there's there's this other aspect of our sexuality that kind of is part of how we govern our relationships, how we make choices in our relationships. And I liked that moment, um, not just about friendship, but that kind of, you know, I think you called it the, a thread um, through the film um, that to me was kind of like Audre Lorde kind of being, you know, her, her thinking kind of being performed, she and a lot of other people, um, throughout the film. So it was, it was really beautiful to see. One last question. Yeah. Sure, I have two questions to make it. Okay, two last questions. <laughs> <laughs> two last questions. <laughs> um, one, was, that, was it really a question if she liked, if Laura liked her or not? Because every lesbian I know from here to DC, uh, we all just kind of assumed that that was kind of a fact. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, because I was yeah. like, "Is this a question?" I was so confused. That's not really a question, but you know, I just. But but you know, sort of going back to the question of art. I mean, I, I like that. I mean, yeah. Oh, okay. But I, but I, but, I, but, I, <laughs> I but like, also I also like you know expanding the conversation a bit and really talking about the ways in which, um, you know, as we we've already belabored the point, the, <laughs> the ways in which erotic energy and you know courses through all of our relationships to some degrees and, and influences the way we connect, who we connect with and how we connect and what choices are made um, in our relationships, whether or not sex is ever, ever um, consummated. consummated. Or not. Yeah. And that last yeah. song though, right? Damn good friends. We could be so much more, but we're right. just such damn good friends. I mean, that's also intentional, right? That that's right. the last thing we hear. So. And then the second question isn't even gay related. It's so random, <laughs> but, um, so when Alike was in the classroom, right, and she's in there with her lunch, and the teacher is like, you know, eating her hummus and carrots, and she's like, you know, I'm eating this. She's like, oh, but this is gonna keep me healthy longer. I think, like with the black community, there's so much focus on health and how, you know, health is so bad. Do you think that that was intentional or just an aside? I think I, I think the role of food, period, in this film is very interesting. The ways in which, you know, you know. Food preparation across multiple cultures is a, is a, is a gesture of love. It's, you know, you, you, you cook, 
you prepare plates, you, you serve plates. And for the father to, there was only one time he actually ate from a, the plate that, was, that his wife presented before him when he ate the spaghetti and drank the beer. Every other plate, he turned down or threw away. And bought other food. And, and brought other food. Outside so food. so I think I think um, a conversation about food, period, in this film is very interesting and, and what it signifies, again, across cultures. Um, that was, to me, one of the most brutal things, um, the ways in which he rejected her via rejecting her food. Um, it was just really, really intense. But that moment, too, though, um, I, I liked it because it established... Um, you know, a, a real trust and familiarity and comfort. Um, and you, yeah, they're not peers, but you know, that the teacher says, you eat that shit? You know, like it breaks down a little bit of something. Like they can have this, you know, it's good. You know, it's like, nah, I'm eating my hummus. And she's got her foot up on the desk. So um, now... There was something about that teacher. Maybe she was just a cool teacher. Maybe she was a queer teacher. Maybe she was both, right? You know, so it's just like, yeah. So that, that moment established a whole lot of other stuff, um, like what you were saying about the safety for Alike to be able to eat her lunch in there, but it's that teacher who can talk with her that way and have her be comfortable and can give her that critique. You know, it's, 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 it's okay. Is it your best? No. And, you know, you had to watch Alike's face kind of, you know, cycled through all this, just like gulp. I thought it was amazing, and now I have to go back and do something else. But yeah, the food, I think in that moment, it's a hinge, you know, that, that that's part of their intimacy, mm -hmm. even as they're having a, a, you know, this kind of little argument about the quality of food and what's, you know, the value judgments around what you're eating and health and, you know, totally valid. Um, but it does kind of cycle out through the rest of the film all those plates of food that Audrey throws away. Um, or the husband think, throws away. The, right, the yeah, husband throws yeah. away, you know. Um, and that I think there's only one scene that we see them all eating together right. at the table. And it's um, a scene where Alike has been sort of exiled from the family, right? When, no, 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 before that, when they're asking, when it's about the prom. Oh, sex at the prom. Sex yeah, at the yeah, prom, yeah. and, you know, it's like this really funny you know, moment, you know, of them being together over a meal. You know, another thing, that, and I, I, can, I can top your randomness. Um, <laughs> another thing I, I, I so love about that scene with the teacher, the teacher, I was joking with Tisa last night, I said, didn't you love when Sheila E. <laughs> and I was, like, was the teacher? And Tisa was like, wait, Sheila E. is the teacher? And I'm like, no. I knew she wasn't. But, she, but the teacher, oh my God, you guys are so young, you don't even know who Sheila E. is. You have to. <laughs> but I love that the teacher looked like Sheila E. because the Sheila E. Like is she such like a, 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 a like lesbian um, icon. And for me, um, to have the teacher look so much like Sheila E. was just almost like a, a sweet kind of in-joke. And, you know, if you're under 30, you don't get the joke. But Yeah, I didn't think she looked as much like Sheila E., that woman wasn't Teacher not fine. Was fine. She was cute. <laughs> she wasn't Rosie Perez. I'll just show my hand. That would have been different. Okay, now the conversation's just gone. <laughs> now into, we're like, going somewhere else area. altogether. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is, is that last comments? Um, do you questions? feel that this has been thoroughly deconstructed, or do you still have a kernel of pleasure of your own that you can take out of here with you? And you know, get your friends to watch this. You know, and this film didn't get like a, a, a huge screening. One of the reasons I missed it um, when it was released, um, there was a lot of shenanigans at the theater. It was supposed to open in, in Glendale and the poster was up for a long time and I'm not sure that the film actually opened at that theater and I didn't, it just kind of disappeared. Um, you know, it's great that it's on video and people are still talking about it. Um, so it, it is important to kind of share Dee Reese's work with Pariah. She also did the Bessie Smith um, uh, film for HBO. Um, but this one, we were, we were talking before um, we came out here, whether, like, you know, looking at the kind of timeline of, of feature length films about black lesbians by black lesbians and trying to fill in the gap between Cheryl Dunye's, maybe Stranger Inside, right? Not the owl, Stranger Inside, 
um, to Pariah, what's in between there for narrative feature length films. Um, and for me, that's why Pariah is, is such a, a landmark film um, for, for the length of time that elapsed before another feature length film came out. Um, and that kind of, you know, that was Bradford Young's kind of breakout, um, you know, in the beautiful way that he shoots black people. Um, wrong phrasing. The beautiful way that he frames black people in color. Wow. Yeah. I did not want to say that, and I did, and now it's streaming, but that's not what I meant. He's a DP. But yeah, to kind of just think about the, the huge gaps in this kind of timeline of black lesbian filmmaking for making features. There's lots of shorts, so support your film festivals, of course, because that's where stuff happens. But when these features come out, um, they're sadly few and far between. Um, and, and this one's really special. All right. Thank you for Thank you. coming out and staying so long. Thank you.